Good morning. We welcome you into the silence as we enjoy our prelude music. Today's a day like any other, but I'm changed. I am a mother, oh, in an instant. And who I was has disappeared. It doesn't matter, now you're here, so innocent. I was lost for you. I will guard it with my life. I'd hang the moon for it to shine on her sleeping. Starting here and starting now, I can feel the heart of how everything changes when my heart's at the wheel now. Mistakes, they make sense when I turn them around. Everything changes. What I thought was so permanent fades. And I swear I'll remember to say we were both born today. Oh, and it's true. What did I do to deserve you? I didn't know, but now I see sometimes what is is meant to be. You saved me. My blurry lines, my messy life come into focus and in time. Maybe. I can heal and I can breathe Cause I can feel myself believe That everything changes When my heart's at the wheel now And all my mistakes, they make sense When I turn them around Everything changes what I thought was so permanent fades But I swear I'll remember to say We were both born today Oh, and it's true What did I do To deserve you Thank Good morning. My name is Joanna Cameron, and it is my joy to read the Daily Word for you today. The Daily Word for today is Time Enough. Our affirmation is, I have enough time for rest, work, pleasure, and prayer. At the end of a busy day, do I focus on appreciating what I achieved, or do I berate myself for those tax, tasks that I have yet to accomplish? The attitude in which I started my day had a great deal to do with the ensuing results. I create each day's experiences through the choices, large and small 
that I make as the day unfolds. My storehouse of divine energy keeps me mentally focused. With a positive attitude, I affirm. I have time enough, wisdom enough, strength enough, and energy enough to do whatever is before me this day. As confidence in my creative power grows, I become clearer and calmer in each choice, and my day perfectly expresses my new consciousness. The daily word is based on the scripture, Mark 1, 15. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. Now let us stand up and sing our opening song together. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. Now that we claim that, whew. we are an all-inclusive community, so please know that whoever you are and wherever you are on your spiritual journey, you are welcome here. As an open-hearted, accepting community, we aspire to this vision, so let's say this together. We are a spiritual community of unconditional love. And to carry that forward, let us say our mission statement together. We inspire and awaken one another to a greater experience of God and life through the practical application of spiritual principles. Now please take a look at our opening statement and read it to yourselves for just a bit. And let's say it aloud together. The attitude in which I start my day has a great deal to do with the ensuing results. And now we'd like to invite you to greet the people nearest to you as a good morning or a namaste in prayer.
Wonderful morning. I am Valerie Lauer, and it is my joy and honor to be your platform assistant for today. <laughs> Please welcome Molly Servatka, accompanied by Charles Vernara, and our music team. <laughs> if this is your first time visiting us, we're so glad that you're here. We invite you to please stand. Anybody new? Please stand. Okay. Well, that's good to have everybody that's been here before, too. So, okay. Well, I won't even go through the rest of the spiel then? Okay, but we're glad that everyone's here today. Thank you for being here. All right. Our board member of the day is Bob Cook. And Bob's standing right back in the booth. He'll be outside the walkway, just behind our sound booth back there. And to chat with you and answer any questions that you may have. This is our last day for Unity in the Community's 22nd Annual School Supply Drive and 14th Annual Hygiene Drive. See your bulletin and stop by our table in the breezeway. Say hi to Madeline and thank you in advance for your support. Licensed Unity teacher Nancy Leahy Jacklow will begin the Eye of the Storm, a Telebridge class on Mondays starting July 30th. Please see your bulletin for required books, registration details, and further information. For anyone interested in becoming a member of Unity of Naples, please sign up at the table in the back of the sanctuary. Our next membership orientation is Saturday, August 11th, from 9 a.m. to 12 noon. Please see your bulletin for details. And as you know, even in the summer, there's a lot going on in our campus. For additional information on ongoing events and classes, please visit us at naplesunity.org or refer to your bulletins. In fact, we encourage you to take your bulletin home, this beautiful bulletin that they worked hard to put together. We don't want anyone to leave with a heavy heart. Should you need assistance during the week, our spiritual counseling, coaching team is always available. Today, our prayer chaplains in the back after the service are here for confidential prayer, and the chapel is right straight back. This is a wonderful way to receive spiritual support and to also celebrate answered prayers, no matter what you are going through in your life. Now is the time we invite you to prepare for our thought for the week. Please turn off your cell phones. All right. 
I like that. Was that the Flintstones or something, I think? <laughs> oh. Okay, set aside any objects or concerns you might have. Get comfortable in your chair. Take a deep breath and know that surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel the mighty power and the grace. I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. In the midst of his children, the Lord said he would be. It doesn't take very many. It can be just two or three. I can feel that same sweet spirit that I felt of times before. Surely I can say I've been with the Lord. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel the mighty power and the grace. There's a holy hush around us. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. As most of you know, we take these few minutes now during the course of our service to establish in consciousness, to appropriate a thought for the week ahead. Those days of the week that have yet to unfold, we prepare ourselves consciously to encounter those days and to impress upon them our consciousness of the truth. And in order to help us, we take with us a very simple statement and affirmation, words filled with power nevertheless, that help to support our journey through the week ahead. So if you'll join me by just relaxing, by breathing easily and freely and deeply, we'll prepare to accept our thought for the week ahead. In order to move through this coming week with the natural ease and grace that become us, we need to proclaim our freedom from past limitation. This is not always easy. Many of us in that phrase carry mental baggage with us. But we can always attempt to eliminate that which would drag us down, prevent us from moving forward gracefully, triumphantly into a future encounter with our good. But we have to take the initial steps that are necessary.
I cannot know what each of you may encounter in this week ahead, nor can I know what legacy you bring from past experience. But I can and do know that an affirmation of release can assist us as we open ourselves to new experience. Consequently, I would proclaim these words as our thought for the week, our very simple affirmation. And we use the I am phrase, I am free. I am free. The I am, remember, reminds us of the presence of spirit within us. It is the creative energy that sustains us always. And it proclaims with us our freedom. As we wait joyously to encounter new experiences, we say, I go forward because I am free. I have this strength, this power, this wisdom within me that enables me to move triumphant into any future encounter. I am free. Let's say that together. I am free. And again, I am free. Think of the implications of these simple words. Simple, simple words. And yet we know we speak our world into being, into manifestation. And when we say, I am free, I am not shackled to past experience. I am not a victim of past circumstance. Every moment gives me the choice of freedom. I am free. There have been those who have said that when they were in chains. I am free. I am free. Affirm it, please, one more time with me. I am free. And let's take that thought, that affirmation, quietly into the silence for a few moments and establish it firmly in consciousness. I am free. I am free. As the dawning of this fundamental freedom spreads in consciousness, 
And as we agree together to affirm this affirmation, this statement, as the week ahead unfolds, we find ourselves giving thanks too for the realization of what it really means in our lives. We give those thanks in the name and in the power of the indwelling Christ Spirit from which we derive all freedom, hope, comfort, joy, and life. Amen. We'll sing our Lord's Prayer. Walking, stumbling on these shadow feet toward home, a land that I've never seen. I am changing, less and less asleep, made of different stuff than when I began, and I have sensed it all along. Fast approaching is the day When the world is falling out from under me I'll be found in you, still standing When the sky rolls up in mountains fall on their knees When time and space are through I'll be found in you There's distraction buzzing in my head Saying in the shadows it's easier to stay But I've heard rumors of true reality Whispers of a well-lit way When the world is falling out from under me I'll be found in you still standing when the sky rolls up in mountains fall on their knees when time and space are through I'll be found in you you make all things new you make all things new you make all things new. You make all things. You make all things. And when the world is falling out from under me, I'll be found in you, still standing. When the sky rolls up in mountains, fall on their knees. When time and space are through. I'll be found in you 
when the world is falling out from under me I'll be found in you still standing every fear and accusation under my feet when time and space are through I'll be found in you when time and space are through I'll be found in you when time and space are through I'll be found in you Well, folks, before we have our mirth moment, I notice I say before we have our mirth moment, I wish to introduce to you a distinguished guest whom most of you know or have known. Uh, I believe the Reverend Albert Wingate is here with us this morning. Where are you? There he is. <laughs> Albert's just with us for a couple of days. I gather he lives in uh, Southern California now, and as you know, he has had and does have a very distinguished uh, career in our unity movement. So, Albert, we're delighted you're here with us. And uh, have you brought your family with you? Uh, wife. Ah, come on, the wife. <laughs> I'm not sure that the wife of a minister doesn't deserve great <laughs> Ask my wife. <clears throat> Mirth moments. By the way, have any of you seen that fantastic ad? I don't know for what company it's promoted, but it, 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 the word impossible appears on a page, and then down below, Somebody has put in an apostrophe, some brilliant ad agent, to say, I am, po you know, you, this solves your apostrophe problems in a moment, of course, but have you seen that? Yeah. Impossible? I am possible. I don't know why we didn't invent that in Unity, but apparently we didn't. <laughs> well, I don't know. Can I still use it? It's copyright, isn't it? I don't know. I, who knows? I might get an attorney's letter. Um, this, these are some little mirth moments that somebody gave me. They're fantastic. If biblical headlines were written in today's press, on the Red Sea crossing, wetlands trampled in labor strike, <laughs> pursuing environmentalists killed, David versus Goliath, hate crime kills beloved champion, Psychologists question influence of rock. <laughs> On the birth of Jesus, hotels full, animals left homeless. Animal rights activists enraged by insensitive couple. <laughs> On feeding the 5,000, preacher steals child's lunch. Disciples mystified over abusive behavior on healing the ten lepers. Local doctors practice ruined. Faith healer causes bankruptcy. <laughs> and then a wonderful one on the healing of the Gadarene demoniac. Madman's friend causes stampede. Local farmer's investment ruined. <laughs> Keep them coming, folks. They're great. Anyway, <laughs> anyway. When I was a kid, I uh, went to a school in England. I'm half American, half English. You know I'm a dual national, and I was born of American parents in Britain, and they wanted me to benefit from an English education. What Dickens said was being brought up by hand. Uh, so they sent me to what over there is called a public school. Now, it's just the opposite of what public school means in America. 
A public school in England is an exclusive private school, a costly private school. I was lucky in a sense because I was a day boy. They were all boys. I was able to go home in the afternoons after school because my parents lived in the town. And so I was lucky to escape for a few hours at least. Because I can assure you the regime was Spartan. Isn't it interesting that today, today teachers fear students. In those days, students fear teachers. <laughs> Something has happened in the last hundred years, and I'm not. Anyway, I was grateful to get out of the place for a few hours. All our teachers, of course, were men, except for our French teacher, who was the most terrifying of all. <laughs> Madame. Brutal. Um, anyway, that's beside the point. But on my, I used to walk home because it wasn't too far. I used to walk home and I made a friend on the walk home. I noticed that he happened to walk home as well. He was older than I. He was about 14 and I was about 9 or 10, I suppose, at the time. And I used to walk home with this guy. His name was Peter. And um, at a certain point in our return journey from school to home, he went to a different school a school on the other end of the town, at the other end of the town. And, of course, it mattered where one lived, still does, doesn't it? We're so tribal. So he went to school down there, and he went to a Catholic, a Catholic school, Catholic, we would call it a high school, I suppose. He was about 14, he was a little older than I, very bright, lovely, beautiful kid. And we used to talk a lot on the way home, but we used to get waylaid by this gang of four townies, who went to the local, we would have called them in England, council school. To here it would be the state school. And uh, they hated kids who went to the public school, like me, and they also detested me because I was Anglo-American. But they reserved their vitriolic hatred for poor Peter. And do you know why? Because he was a Catholic. He went to a Catholic school, and they used to trap us on the way home. They used to sort of waylay us. And, you know, they'd punch us up, knock us around a bit, and uh, generally abuse us. And they used to hurl these terrible epithets at Peter. You know, the Anglo-Saxons invented the four-letter word. You knew that, didn't you? <laughs> and uh, some of you can be a little shocked if you go to England today and realize that the Anglo-Saxons still like for letter words in the press as well as privately. I have to say in all honesty that when you get up in the middle of the night and you stub your toe on the way to the toilet, I, there's something wonderful about the release of a few four letters. <laughs> now, I say nothing of, any, uh, of regular discourse, but um, sometimes in a moment of acute agony. <laughs> anyway, they used to hurl every epithet at this poor kid that you could imagine. And, uh, you know, this used to happen two or three times a month, I suppose, and uh, when I was walking home and when we joined together. But eventually, I think he left. He probably moved somewhere. I never saw him again. But he said to me before I went, you know, we are born to be victims. We have to be victims. That's, that's our cross to bear. We have to suffer victimization. We had quite sophisticated conversations. And um, I, I, I could never buy into that. I could never get that one. I mean, there was plenty of opportunity for one to feel victimized, certainly. I was willing to concede that, but to accept that as as a fundamental description of the nature of my being, seemed to me not only abhorrent, but mistaken. Why? Why should I be? What did I do to be a victim? Can you tell these people in the Yemen, in Syria, in Afghanistan, the old, the elderly, the sick, the women, the children, that they are, they are inevitably the victims? What have they done? to be victims. There are people who are genuinely victimized in this world. We've all met them. And our sorrow and our compassion, I hope, is made manifest. It's a terrible thing.
to be genuinely victimized by others, by their anger, their greed, their jealousy, their hatred, as with Peter. I had never encountered that kind of tribal hatred before. Didn't know it existed. Racial intolerance, religious intolerance, to that extent, appalling. It was an education. But I vowed at that point and subsequently have reaffirmed this belief. I have said I am not going to willingly or wittingly acknowledge the role of victim. I won't do it because it's going to hold me back. It's going to drag me back, drag me down. It doesn't matter if circumstances have conspired against me. Maybe God doesn't like me. I mean, there could be a few moments when in the middle of running the universe, he, she, or it sort of zaps various people. I don't know. But there's a classic story that I've always liked in Scripture. It's not often that I, I go to the Old Testament for inspiration because it can be a pretty discouraging or dispiriting read, but true nevertheless, possibly. But I want to read you this wonderful story briefly about Joseph. You remember Joseph? He with the coat of many colors. That's probably not a, a good translation of the expression that describes the coat he wore, but this is from Genesis, from 37. Jo Joseph came up to his brothers. They stripped him of the long sleeved robe which he was wearing the coat of many colors. They took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty and had no water in it. Midianite merchants passed by and drew Joseph up out of the pit. They sold him for 20 pieces of silver, as a slave, of course, to Ishmaelites, and they brought Joseph, they brought Joseph to Egypt. What a classic description of victimization. I mean, can you imagine your own brothers? They take everything off you, they throw you into a pit with no sustenance, no water, nothing. I mean, it's pretty discouraging, quite frankly. Isn't that the classic, the classic description of a victim? And yet, a page or two later, a page or two later, we write, the Lord was with Joseph and he prospered. He'd been sold down in Egypt. He lived in the house of his Egyptian master, who saw that the Lord was with him and was giving him success and strength in all that he undertook. Thus Joseph found favor with his master and became his personal servant. Indeed, his master put him in charge of his household and entrusted him with all that he had. He became the steward of the household. Now it's true that later on, Joseph got into a little bit of trouble in that household because of jealousy, but again, he pulled himself out of that. He was victimized twice by those whom he had every reason to trust. And yet he would not succumb to the notion of victimhood, of victimization. That's always been a story that's inspired me. And I think it should inspire us. Because most of us have been through experience, maybe bullying in school, I don't know. It's fairly prevalent. On the internet, on Facebook, I don't know. I mean, there are people in this country, young people, every year, who, God forbid, commit suicide because they've accepted that role of utter degradation and victimization. How can this be when we need to lift up the spirits, when we need hope and joy, when we need to go forward and show the world what we have to offer and to give? It's a tragedy, it's a travesty, and it shouldn't be, but it is. And you know, if you look at your psychology, if you have the courage, <laughs> if you have the courage to psychoanalyze yourself, God forbid, it's a bit dangerous. <laughs> but it's better than paying $150 an hour. <laughs> if you begin to look at <clears throat> your own behavior, you begin to see we begin to see, I begin to see, that there are many times when I've un unconsciously almost accepted this victim's role. We do it all the time. We say, well, 
I didn't get that job or I didn't get that position or I didn't achieve this or that or the other in life because I was victimized, maybe by, by, by a jealous employer, by, by somebody I worked with, by, God forbid, my race or religion. I was victim, and maybe you were. But have we accepted that, as poor old Peter did when he said, you know, we're born to be victims. I've often wondered what happened to him. I haven't the faintest idea. He could be still alive for all I know. <laughs> maybe he flourished as a victim. Well, sometimes, sometimes we use victimization to our advantage. When we were kids, didn't we manage to get that extra day at home out of our parents when, oh, Mom, I can't possibly go to school. I feel so ill. Oh, oh, classic victim of the flu or whatever we, we had. And our mothers being compassionate people, I hope. I don't know where our fathers were at that point. But our mothers being compassionate people probably said, you, you can have another day at home, Jane, or you can have another, another day at home, Johnny. More and more chicken soup, and undoubtedly. It's never appealed to me, chicken soup. <laughs> there are other remedies that might work. I but they're not for children. Anyway. <clears throat> I once, many years ago, had a very dear friend who um, was a retired rabbi, and um, he had suffered terribly during the war and the anti, the pre-war years in Europe, and had lost all his family in what a Jewish people, frankly, I think, would prefer to call the Shoah. The Holocaust, the word Holocaust, has very unfortunate connotations for Jewish people, stemming from Old Testament understandings. I don't want to go into those, but the word Shoah is a better, translated from the Hebrew, S-H-O-A-H, Shoah, it, it really means the great misfortune, which, of course, the Holocaust certainly was. But we used to talk about it very frankly. He found that he could talk openly about his experience. He lost his entire family. And he said, you know, my family and many of my friends, Jewish friends, seem to accept the role of victim almost willingly. Now, there was Jewish resistance, certainly, in the Second War. Very brave Jewish resistance. But the majority, not only of Jews, but of Romanes, of those who had different, different sexual opinions, of political opponents, uh, many thousands, tens of thousands, millions even, Soviet soldiers, over two million, died of starvation, deliberately imposed upon them. I mean, this horror, this absolute horror, is victimization of the worst imaginable kind. And I, I used to say to him, how did you respond psychologically to this? There's a man, there was a man called Viktor Frankl. Uh, some of you may have read his work. He was a Viennese Jew. He wrote a book called Logotherapy, beautifully, beautifully written and very appealing to unity people. But I asked, I asked Isaac, this man, I said, how did you combat that feeling of utter degradation? Your own people, your own people, casting you into the waterless pit, expecting you to die a horrible death. How did you deal with this? Classic victim. He said, I refused to be victimized. I refused to play the role of victim. I absolutely refused and I asserted my individuality, my power, my strength to move beyond that. And subsequently, he did become a, quite a well-known professor, I think at Columbia. But he was an older man when I knew him, quite recently as a matter of fact. But he refused to take on the role of victim. It's so extraordinary. It's wonderful to find someone who has the moral and spiritual courage to resist what sometimes the world does to them. 
And I think this is something that we all need to remember. Our experiences with victimization may be, may be trivial. Maybe we were pushed around a bit at school. Maybe our loved ones or our parents or our siblings were unkind to us and tried to trivialize what we did and dismiss what we said. We've all had experiences of victimization. Have we taken those on board? Do we use them sometimes to get that little bit of extra compassion that we feel we need? I've met people who've lived all their lives as witting victims because they get a tremendous amount of mileage out of it. And who's to blame them? I mean, if you've been hurt in that way, wouldn't you try to turn it to some kind of advantage? But that kind of advantage is not what is really productive and creative. We have to resist, resist all that put down and say, I am, I am of value. In the sight of that which made us, in the sight of that which made us. You can call it God or anything you want, the divine wisdom, the creative principle, I don't care. In the sight of that which made us, each one of us has, has equal dignity and worth. Don't you think that? Can you not believe that? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And it doesn't matter how many put-downs we experience, how many times we're told we're nothing, cast into pits? Everybody has that worth and dignity that our Creator intended. We were not made to be victims, except of our own doubts and fears and uncertainties. That's what does us in. We resist that. We are triumphant. We are free. Now I'll shut up. Thank you, Nicholas. That was wonderful. Okay, as the ushers come forward, let us each take our tithe, our offering, our gift in hand with conscious awareness. In the very act of doing this, we are engaging the most powerful of universal laws, that of giving and receiving. As we bless these gifts, we invoke good upon them. We open the flow of abundance to us and to this wonderful spiritual community. And we prepare ourselves to receive all the good God has for us. Let us mindfully and gratefully affirm our offering blessing together. Divine love through me blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. Thank you, God. I miss the days my mind would just rest quiet. My imagination hadn't turned on me yet. I used to let my words wax poetic, but it melted a puddle at my feet now. It is a calcifying crime, it's tragic. I've turned a petrified past life baggage. I want to disappear and just start over. So here we are. And I'll breathe again. Cause I have sent for a warrior from on my knees make me a hercules i was meant to be a warrior please make me a hercules 
I've lost a grip on where I started from I wish I thought ahead and left a few crumbs I'm on the hunt for who I've not yet become But I'd settle for a little equilibrium There is a war inside my heart gone silent both sides are satisfied and somewhat violent. The issue I have now begun to see, I am the only lonely casualty. This is not the end though, cause I have sent for a warrior from on my Make me a Hercules I was meant to be a warrior Please make me a Hercules Cause I have sent for a warrior From on my knees Make me a Hercules I was meant to be a warrior This is my darkest hour Our road has led me out here But I only need to turn around To face the light And decide Flight or fight Cause I for a warrior from on my knees and make me a Hercules I was meant to be cause I have sent for a warrior from on my knees make me a Hercules I was meant to be a warrior, please make me a Hercules. Well, thank you again, all of you, for coming this morning. By the way, how many of you have I been able to reach personally, by, by phone or letter or, or visit? Okay, well, I'm still working at it, okay. <laughs> I'm going to invite, if they care, uh, uh, our good friends, the Wingates, to join me in our little reception line. Uh, would you do that? Thank you, absolutely, because I know you'd like to greet them as well. That's wonderful. Okay, we do have, if you would like to join our church, a sign-up sheet at the back. We're going to have an orientation in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, I assure you it's a fairly easy process. There are no, there are no snap tests or anything like that. And <laughs> if you don't know the year Charles Fillmore was born, I'll tell you, so don't worry about that. <laughs> of all ways of getting you through. So anyway, let's pause now and just give thanks for these offerings, which this morning here were so freely given. We bless them, we consecrate them. Most importantly, we dedicate them only, only to the furtherance of God's will and God's work in and through this Christ-like ministry. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Amen. Amen. We're walking in the light of God. Walking, walking, we're walking in the joy of God. We're 
Good morning, everyone. Yeah, I'm Elizabeth Smith, your Youth and Family Ministries Director. Today we learned about a new virtue, the virtue of mercy. I have two friends who would like to share what we did and what we learned today. First is Berkeley. So our virtue, yes, was mercy. The craft was his heart to show mercy to each and every one of us. Oh, thank you. So our, our, what Berkeley just showed us is a forgiveness wand to remind us that we forgive our friends, we forgive ourselves, and we show love. That's how we show mercy. And this is Rayleigh. The story um, was about, so like, the king, the slave owed the king lots and lots of money, and um, he didn't have enough, so the sla so the king, um, the king forgave him, and he, first he was gonna put his whole family in slavery, but then he forgave him, and um, he he um, he let him be free, and then the second slave um, let the owed the um, first slave money and the um, the second slave didn't have enough money so then um, the first slave said put him in jail instead of forgiving him okay. <clears throat> yeah. so we have two examples of forgiveness and non-forgiveness and we kind of know who came out the better. So, <laughs> um, so sometimes mercy is about giving people a second chance, giving them another chance to live their truth. So thank you so much for letting us share. Thank you. Now let's all stand and hold hands and sing our closing song. for protection. The light of God surrounds us. The love of God enfolds us. The power of God protects us. The presence of God watches over us. Wherever we are, God is and all is well. <laughs>